the, the one of the things that's that's interesting about the the army as your your single provider for your health care is it's also the employer and it's also sometimes the the landlord so you've got this this whole soup to nuts of of people um, inhabiting our health care system uh, so we have um, public health missions we have wellness missions we have you know pediatric on through geriatric so it's a really large health care organization that's also the payer um, as, as you might imagine that um, and, and it's interesting, and I was just telling Lee, as, as we were having the run-up to the discussion about the Affordable Care Act, it kind of struck me as somewhat surprising that there was so little reference to what was going on within our system. As you talk about a public option, and you talk about single payer, and you talk about these different degrees to which the, the government entities are going to be involved in how health care gets paid for and how it gets delivered, we, we've had this kind of ongoing trial um, within the country for, for decades, which is the military health care system. And so we, we have this system. It's got a lot of bureaucracy to it. It's um, got a lot of ways in which it lets me as a provider deliver care without having to worry necessarily about the cost to the patient. It's got these advantages and disadvantages. And I think that's part of what I want to talk about tonight is how, what, we, what we can learn from that, and in particular how the the the, the large and, and kind of cumbersome nature of its bureaucracy um, can be a, a retardant to innovation. And how do you how do you in, uh, how do you focus on that? How do you approach an organization like that with a bright idea? Um, so it's it can be challenging, and and it tends to um, tends to resist um, innovation. And but I think that there are ways to that we can say if you if you add value in the right way, you can innovate within that system. Premier has 2.2 million members uh, in Washington and Alaska, and it's the Blue Cross plan in, in the area. And to your point, I mean, it still is a, a health insurance company, but what really attracted me to it is about two years ago, it decided to, Premier and the leadership decided to try a new mission statement and, and a new commitment. And the, the commitment is to make healthcare work better, which is a pretty bold statement for a traditional health insurance company, but um, it does have some unique leadership and, and the goal is to take the patient's perspective and try to figure out how do we solve for what we all know is a broken system. And the four pillars uh, are, from the patient's perspective, are I sometimes get what I don't need, and that's overuse. I sometimes don't get what I need, that's underuse. It costs too much and the patient experience isn't what I wish it would be. So those are the four pillars that, that we're trying to focus on. Over the last 25 years, employers have shifted very strongly towards self-insurance, and now they're starting to throw their economic weight around, and that, that's underneath this shift from fee-for-service toward value. Does that make sense? Do, do, do you think the military system uh, has something to teach us in terms of how to think differently uh, 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 regarding how to provide health care when, when it's not a fee-for-service? The, the biggest challenge is aligning the incentives with, with doing the right thing. And when you have fee-for-service, for, for all of its flaws, you, you tend to get you know, return on value for what you put into it. So you could say, well, someone maybe is doing too many of a certain procedure, and that's one of the, one of the excesses and one of the challenges with fever service. But in general, you provide care as a, as a physician, you get paid, and, and it's a transactional nature. When you, when you move to uh, an employer-run uh, service, or in the Army's case, where the Army is both employer and insurer, those incentives don't really work well. And what you find are, are pockets of really awful inefficiency because that's where the incentives drive it. You know, if, if your incentive is, uh, and not to put too fine a point on it, but if, if, if you get paid regardless of whether you do procedures, then even someone who's, who's got a great moral character is going to kind of be drawn to say, well, what's really my incentive to, to stay till 8 o'clock at night doing these procedures? It's, it's a challenging system that when you set up the incentives in such a way that you drive it toward inefficiency. And, and I think that that's one of the things that you'll continually see is a pocket of inefficiency develops, it gets recognized, and you sort of have to have a top-down approach to addressing it. Well, you, you, you must meet this you know, metric of, of, of output um, to be 
considered successful. So it ends up trying to sort of mimic some of the virtues of fee-for-service, but it doesn't do it organically. And I think that's one of the real challenges as we move to this is to say, can you first identify these incentives, you know, figure out where they are, and are they aligned? Are you, are you getting something, does, does everyone within the system, and it applies to the patient too, do you get something good for doing the right thing, or do, or do you get rewarded for doing the wrong thing or not get punished, um, or get punished for doing the right thing? Those are the challenges that continually crop up in this kind of system and as innovators, I think you need to say, well, can I help? It may be what I do, before you sort of look at the, the value of the innovation kind of in a vacuum, look at it from the, 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 the workflow and the incentive structure that you're trying to insert it into. Employers are pushing uh, for this, and we've boiled it down to two things. One is they want lower costs, um, and that is the higher priority. Um, and then two is they want a better patient experience. And part of the patient experience from the health plan perspective is they want simple and easy because they don't see simple and easy in the health insurance industry. So that's from the employer perspective. Um, my own personal view is I think the bigger elephant in the room is why do you need insurance companies to begin with? So the question is can you achieve more aligned incentives with a single payer plan. And then what's the reason we don't? And that's the way in this country, the market takes a little bit more precedence over the right to healthcare. Whereas in other countries, they're willing to overcome that um, attachment to market solutions and they, they, uh, they put primacy on the right to healthcare. So the question in my mind is, how much can you accomplish if you keep the market in there and don't have a single payer? I'm pretty impressed, to be quite honest, with the solution that ACA came up with, and I think a lot of it is because it came out of Dartmouth and all the work that Dr. Wenberg has done there. And I do think that it's aligned incentives more, and it's created an environment of healthcare transformation that I personally was skeptical of. I didn't think payment reform could push healthcare transformation, but I do think we've all seen that it has to some degree. Now the question is, how far has it really gone? Of course there's a variety of incentives, but there's no question that financial incentives are one of the big sets. Um, and uh, how, are, how are, the, are those starting to change? I mean, who has a financial incentive to do things differently? What are the pressures driving uh, each of your systems? So the pressures driving us is that uh, half of care in the United States is, is paid for by the government, either federal, state, or local, but the other half is paid by households or private business. And actually 30% is paid by households. Oh, and, really? oh. and then 20% by private business. And, and we, hear, we feel a lot of that pressure uh, because they just have a stronger voice because they're more United, but the higher deductible health plans um, and the continual increases in costs uh, above CPI, which has been eroding middle class wages, I think all that puts a pressure on both those, those things, both cost and patient experience. Now, to get a little deeper into your question, I, my own personal opinion is that the the underlying thermodynamics of the healthcare system has not changed. The business model is the same. There is, on the surface, more movement to ACOs and bundles and more talk of value. Um, but I, I guess I, I'm a little bit of a, a naysayer in that I, ha I don't see the, the complete switchover. Um, I don't think the hospitals have had the courage or, or the inclination to make the move. I don't, maybe there hasn't been enough impetus in the system. We had this, um, this episode where we were talking about applying for a Baldrige Award at our hospital. And the foundational discussion was, it's, about a, it's, a, it's a customer service award, and it was who's our customer. And we had the really long discussion about, well, who is our customer? Mm -hmm. Is it the patient? That's what, what your typical hospital, you'd think, well, your hospital, you, your customer is the patient. I was like, well, is it the people that work there? Is it the federal government? And, and actually the whole thing literally fell apart because we couldn't figure out 
really who is at the end of the day is our customer. And that's one of the challenges that we continually run into is do we try and add value to the federal government and return, you know, lower cost and, and, and for the same amount of health care? Or do we try and deliver the absolute best patient care to a patient? We talk about the, you know, the patient experience and we survey our patients and we, we pay our hospitals back based on the response survey data they get, but it's a pretty clunky mechanism for incorporating essentially patient choice in a system where their choices are highly constrained by the fact that it's a single payer. So we, again, we struggle with this. Of, of, are we giving value? Is it, is it closer to being right where the provider says, I, I, I'm not given the tools to do the job of being asked to do? Or is the, the federal government right in saying, that this is an inefficient system and you need to have different management. So we, we struggle with that. Is there a change in thinking? Is there a change in practice? Um, uh, how, how dynamic is it really? So I'm going to say something paradoxical. I definitely think there's been a lot of change. Oh. But I just want to emphasize that I don't think the underlying business model has changed. But okay. I, in the last 10 years, I've seen significant change. Um, there's like I said, I was surprised because I was a I was skeptical that payment reform would induce a lot of provider systems to, to do clinical transformation or, or healthcare transformation, but they have, and the, and now they're talking about value and they're talking about the patient experience. But I think two limitations to it is uh, one is physician burnout, you know, the change fatigue and. Everyone has change fatigue. We have it in the in the insurance industry, but I think that limits how much you can do. Uh, and then the other is the the history of the '90s when a lot of provider systems took on downside risk and went bankrupt. And so I think because the underlying business model doesn't want to go through that again, that's where you get the 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 pullback. And there's a lot more interest in bundles and and dipping your toe into value, but not going mm -hmm. all in. I don't think we're going back. Um, but I, I think the point I'm trying to make is, if you don't do single payer, then there's a limitation to how far you can get. And so I think there will continue to be uh, the movement towards value at a, at a, a slow pace, and, and it'll be positive change. But I think we have to ask ourselves, how far can that go if you don't change uh, the underlying system. Beginning to understand costs and, and try to optimize for costs, is, is, is that part of this fundamental shift that you think is gonna persist kind of independent of the politics? To a large degree, not completely, but to a large degree, I can make decisions based on clinical indications. Right, right. And that's something that is just in the, in the core DNA of a lot of providers is, is to, to be on the patient team. And so we start dividing up the, we, we sort of started picking teams. You've got the payer, you've got the, the hospital, you've got the, the doc and the nurse, you've got the patient. It, one of the challenges with, with going to these uh, accountable care models is you start to take the providers and put them on the side of the payers. Yeah. And yeah. I, I really think we, we need to try and find as many ways as possible to resist that because that, the patient, knows eventually, maybe not individually, but, but corporately the, our, our, our patients will know and it won't be a satisfying system in which to work. And, and once it becomes an unsatisfying system, there are a lot of ripple, negative ripple effects that come from that. So as we, as we look at this, I think that do you want providers to be ignorant of cost? No, you want them to manage responsibly, but I think it's good to have that management a little bit top down, you know, to say here are some constraints, some lanes you operate under, and then go do, go do the best doctoring you can. On the one level, I agree that there's a lot of opacity to cost and there's a need for more transparency and there's too much variability and, and there's no good reason for it. But at a macro level, I, I think it's worth looking and, and for our discussion on innovation, looking to how countries spend money on healthcare and social services. We've got a very costly system. So there's five cost drivers. One are the health insurance companies, two are the doctors, three are the hospitals, four is pharma, and five is the biotech industry. So if, if you go to single payer, let's say, and you, and you do away with that part, I'm, what I'm telling you is that's not going to solve your cost problem. 
you're still going to be spending close to 18% on, so you're going to have to address the other four. So let's put the, the docs aside and, and focus on the hospitals, the, the pharma, and the biotech industry. So the hospitals, um, their margins are way above uh, CPI, and there's different ways to try to address it, but basically you, you have to confront the issue. And then pharma and biotech, when you have a system that's very market-based and has a very loose definition of what innovation is and just allows um, a lot more into the system than, than we can really afford, then I think you're going to have a problem. So until we are willing to talk about those things and face them, I think the cost is just going to continue no matter what you do with the health insurance industry. Is innovation needed? Is the needed in innovation different than what it has been traditionally in light of these new pressures and, and so forth. Uh, what can innovators do to be constructive? People will resist changes if they're even mildly impactful in their workflow. And that's, that's one of the challenges with this system is because it, this, this push toward value um, has really squeezed, I think, a lot of the, the, the play out of the system in terms of the, the, the typical doctor-patient healthcare visit that the, the innovator has to, to recognize and work with people in that space to say, where do I fit into their workflow? If it's, a, if it's an IT innovation, is it, you know, is it two clicks too many and, and the person just not going to adopt my widget in, into their workflow? Those are, those are things that I think that innovators have, have in the past perhaps been able to say, we'll work that out after we get the, the tech developed. And I'm saying that they're actually foundational to what you're trying to do. If you want, if you uh, haven't answered the okay. adoption question right. and how it's going to fit into both the workflow and the payment model, then you, you may be investing your time and effort in something that, that has no chance. I approach innovation the way you do a differential diagnosis. So as a physician, you come up with a list of, let's say, 20 diagnoses, and you continually hit it up against the patient and ask more questions, do more tests, and you slowly get to what the diagnosis is, hopefully. And hopefully it's the right one. Now the same thing with innovation. Um, let's just say there's 100 units of new stuff out there. So you produce new stuff. Then you need to know it's safe. And so then you, you have the FDA try to say whether it's safe. And let's say out of the 100 units, 95 of them end up being safe because most developers are pretty good at knowing that they have to pass the safety standard. And that's kind of what gets thrown out in the current market. Um, but, but then there's efficacy and effectiveness. So efficacy is, is it better than a water pill, a, a sugar pill, or is it better than nothing? You know, and maybe 50 of them are, are better, better than nothing or better than a water pill. And then you want to know, is it better than what's currently available? And that's comparative effectiveness or a good health technology assessment approach, which we don't have at the federal level, but we do have it at the state level. And then the last question, which we don't really do anywhere in this country, is cost-effective analysis. Is it better, but is it worthwhile better? Um, is it worth the price? Is the marginal benefit better? And that is a true innovation. And it's probably about 5% of the 100 units. And I don't feel that we have a good definition here to define that innovation and drive it towards that 5%, it's, it's being driven in, a, in a too much of a dispersed fashion. We need innovation and that engine to keep going. Um, but what I would say is the question, what is it you're looking for with innovation? Are, are you looking for m monetary reward? Um, if so, this is the great system for that. Um, but if you're trying to also try to move the ball further in the value scheme, then I'd say uh, try, try to go to the, the sites of care where there's actual change happen. Uh, they're putting in lean, lean approaches and trying to improve their processes and kind of just live in that space. And if there's anybody I would live with, it would be the primary care doctors, the pharmacists, the nurses, and see what they're having to deal with and why they're burning out. It really will move the, the ball further uh, as far as the new value paradigm. UDA is Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. Um, and, and what they decided was that the U.S. pilots were just better, didn't have better tech, but were better decision makers in the moment. And what I would, m what my advice would be, and it builds on what you're saying, is that 
I, I think a lot of times we get into sort of decide act and you, you, you get really um, caught up in what your innovation is and, and you can cl it's clearly obvious to you that this is gonna be a great thing and it probably is. The challenge is th that I think, and I, I run into companies that, that seem to have not done enough of the OO. So the observe orient is get out, you know, take your idea at, at the earliest possible stage to people to give you some feedback. And, and you know, try, it can usually be low cost feedback. It doesn't have to be uh, necessarily immersing yourself for a long time, but to, to figure out who's gonna use this, what, and, and what incentive structure are they working under, would it, me would it mean something to their practice? If you, can, if you can shave one minute off of the time it takes me to write a clinic note, I will kiss your feet and adopt your tech in a heartbeat because that's the, that's the pain point. And if you don't know the pain point of the people that you're trying to innovate for, you, you, you run the risk of creating an innovation with no market. And so it, the more times you can run your OODA loop in your, in your innovation of take some observations, you figure out where it fits in, am I, am I in the right track, make decisions, iterate your product, it, that's the act, and then take it back. I think that that's one of the, one of the lessons that I would say is I, I've run into too many times that I, I think people haven't gotten that feedback early and maybe have gone down a rabbit hole that's, that ends up being wasted time that may end up even compromising the ability to take a good innovation all the way to the end. So we talk about the, the valley of death and that's the most common way this is put, but I really think it's more about getting as many observations and correct course corrections so that you can take it um, to the correct spot and, and map it to the value within the current system. Hi, I'm Bruce Smith. I'm the medical director here at Regents. And, uh, but for eight years, I worked at Group Health, which is similar to a military system in that they are fully capitated and they're paid to keep people well and not just to do more stuff. And the logic at Group Health had always been, and Kaiser, because they work very closely together, and in fact, in another two weeks, they will be together. Um, the, the idea was that the fully integrated, capitated system ought to be about 10% more efficient than the fee-for-service model. Uh, operationally, it's challenging to pull that off, it turns out. Um, and, but they're probably more comparable in a, in a commercial fee-for-service model versus an HMO model than it is the civilian market versus the military health system because they have different incentives. But group health in general comes, and Kaiser both, and other HMO style systems end up coming in at about the same price point as most commercial health plans currently, even though in theory, internally at Group Health and Kaiser, they believe they ought to be able to do it for about 10% less. I think as long as there's this attachment to a market approach, um, I see it difficult to do away with commercial health insurance or the business model um, that, you, that you describe. I do see uh, consolidation in both the provider side and in the health insurance side. So there is a question of whether the nonprofit health plans like the Blue Crosses, Blue Shields are, can survive in the long term and if it's just going to be the top three or four for-profit health uh, insurance companies. So that is something that our industry struggles with, especially those of us who aren't in that, in that realm. And then on the provider side, in preparation for the ACA, there's a lot of market consolidation which is still ongoing and the research shows that any claim that it, in, it, it results in better integration and therefore better care is completely overshadowed by the fact that it just raises prices. Uh, so there might be some integration, but oftentimes there's not. Uh, it's kind of a roll of the dice, but what is always true is they gain stronger market share and they can uh, get higher prices. So when somebody thinks they have a great idea, how do they get to you to elevate that and see if it interests you? What are the advantages, what resources do your organizations bring that allows somebody, whether it be academia, whether it be a small business that says, I think I've solved world hunger, would you consider this? What, what, what can they do with your organizations to, to try that out? Assuming you've done what I suggested, which is you've kind of got at least a preliminary idea of where it fits into into to my workflow or, or one of my colleagues' workflow, then that's where our system has what I think is a lot of untapped potential. And that's kind of been, when I described my mission of, of the, over the past couple of years, I've been trying to find ways to say, hey, look, Army, you have this, these strategic goals that 
that benefit by interacting with innovators. And our, and our system has sort of its own way of doing it, which is we get together some really smart people, they identify a need, they get the resources for it and put out calls for proposals and you apply for a grant through a, like a broad agency announcement and it's a really protracted process that can result in really substantial grants six to 18 months down the road. So not really fitting in with the idea of, hey, I'm a young, hungry innovator. For us, it would be if it's a drug or a medical device, uh, we have uh, p and 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 medical uh, policy committees that have uh, membership in the community and physicians that we have at, at Primera. And really, it would have to have gone through clinical trials and randomized control trials and got into either Cochrane or had a good health technology assessment say that, yeah, it's been proven to be better or work. Um, and that's a long, a long thing. We don't, we try not to talk directly to um, those types of innovators because we feel it should come out in the literature. If it's something that's not a drug or a medical intervention, then that's a lot more ad hoc. That sometimes we get connected with people and sometimes we don't. It's, it's a lot more um, not as, as structured as the drug and medical device. There's some gems in here about the fact that we actually have well-established case studies of different ways of paying for and operating healthcare. And when we have innovative ideas, there are places where we could find interested parties uh, uh, to partner with and to, to prove some of these things. One of my favorites that Phil alluded to is that the people who actually study international comparisons say that, well, it isn't just that the U.S. spends a lot more money on health care. It's that we also spend a lot less on social services. And the, the evidence suggests that those two are strongly interactive. One of my hypotheses is that if I could figure out a way to remake, even at double the investment, uh, the world of social work, I can probably get a 5x ROI in health cost reduction. I'm just, just as an example of, of, of we, have our, we, we have narrowed our thinking in this country. We've screwed up the insurance marketplace. We've, we've got, we've, we're ideologically committed to markets, uh, but we've, we've got a bunch of stuff that's goofy, and it'll be interesting to see if we can figure out how to change it. But really effective innovations that demonstrate change uh, will, I think, be what, what breaks this loose. 